Julie, are you muted? Welcome. Um, my name is Scott Portman, president of the Chicago chapter of the ICAA. I'd like to thank everyone for coming tonight and um, being a part of our uh, first online event of the year. Um, the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art is dedicated to advancing the practice and appreciation of the classical and vernacular traditions in architecture and the allied arts. Primarily, we're an educational organization working in the spirit of the Ecole de Beaux Arts to provide a solid foundation for architects and designers. The study of precedence, proportion, and scale is key to the ability to create new designs that are balanced, appropriate, and meaningful to today's users. The focus on hand drawing and sketching is critical to problem solving and creativity. But the ICAA's focus is on principles that are universal proportion, balance, scale and beauty. These principles form the building blocks for language of design, regardless of style or period, modern or traditional. Please visit our website at classicistchicago.org for more details on this and future events and the benefits of membership. I'm delighted to co-host tonight's presentation with the Benjamin Marshall Society. And I'd like to take a moment to introduce Jane Lepo, president of the Benjamin Marshall Society, who is instrumental in organizing tonight's presentation. Jane. Hello. Hi, Scott. Thanks so much for the wonderful introduction. Um, I'm so happy. The society is so happy to be collaborating with ICAA once again. And we look forward, I'm going to mention, we look forward to another collaboration on Mar, I mean, sorry. February 17th, uh, and it will be on Stuart Cohen's book uh, on uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and the building of the Steinway uh, Hall. So stay tuned, We're, we are collaborating on that. So I'm, I'm very excited to, to look forward to that. The Benjamin Marshall Society was uh, co-founded by myself and my husband in 2002. And thanks to Thomas McMenamin, of Masuda Funai, uh, Eifert, and Mitchell, uh, we became a full-fledged non-for-profit in 2003. Uh, so we're we're you know we're moving forward. We have a book out, we have a, a film out, and um, and and more and more people are are finding out about Benjamin Marshall. Uh, the mission of our society is to educate the public on the name, life, works of Benjamin Marshall, and to uh, to encourage his uh, his uh, discussion on the uh, the 
the mission of, of the urban environment and also the uh, civil environment, and also to revive his dialogue on the um, on other architects, whether they are modern or contemporary. So under the aegis of Benjamin Marshall, you will see a webinar on Mies van der Rohe as well. So please stay tuned for all the wonderful things coming up. We do have a membership uh, 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 department and you can find that on our website at www.benjaminmarshallsociety.org. And without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Shannon Burns, who is the Educational Director at the Mays Lake Peabody Estate. And um, Shannon, uh, take it from here. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm really excited tonight to give you a tour and talk via Zoom about uh, the Mays Lake Peabody Estate. I'm going to share my screen and then we'll go through slides. If you do have questions, hold them till the end and then type them um, and then we'll make sure all of your questions get answered. Look at that, it worked. So Mays Lake Peabody Estate, um, this is one of the original photos um, right after it was built. Um, we're just going to walk through and I'll talk to you about the mansion and about the man, Mr. Peabody. I am uh, Shannon Burns. Here's my contact information, my uh, phone number and email at the Forest Preserve District of DuPage County. If you want to get in touch for a visit, call me. If you want more information, call me. If you want to become a volunteer researcher, call me. Uh, we have all kinds of opportunities here and I'm happy to uh, meet with you and show you around. So the building, Benjamin Marshall was the architect, and this is the way the building looked um, right after Francis uh, Stuyvesant Peabody died. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, it was the ownership was originally with Francis Stuyvesant Peabody. Um, he built this from 1919 to 1921, and he died in 1928. Uh, two. So he lived here just under 14 months, which was really sad. He died young at age 63. His son had uh, converted to Catholicism after he got married. And uh, when Mr. Peabody died, his children were already grown. His second wife didn't want to stay in the area. So um, his uh, Mr. Peabody's son, um, Stuyvesant Peabody, um, sold it to the Franciscan Order of Friars Minor. And it was actually, if you look at the documentation for that, it, it was a little bit, um, it's kind of humorous because um, Stuyvesant Peabody starts kind of badgering the Franciscan Friars in uh, St. Louis. He heard they were looking for a, a retreat center up here. He starts badgering them and they start writing to the bishop up here in Chicago and going, there's no reason why an order of monks dedicated to poverty would want to buy a mansion. And But eventually it happened. Um, he ended up uh, selling the mansion and 900 acres with a, a whole bunch of different farms on it to the Franciscan Orders of Friars Minor in, 1990, in 1924. The Friars owned it until 1992. Uh, they paid $470,000 for 900 acres, all of the farms and the building. And uh, they eventually over, over a few years sold off some of the property. So by the time uh, the Franciscans were ready to close up shop and walk away, they had 88 acres left and um, a building that was almost 100 years old in various states of disrepair. They had uh, a contract to sell it to a developer so the property would become condominiums. Some people in the public got involved, which again is a testament to community service and community pride. People in the area got involved, formed the Maze Lake Conservancy. And based on that, the Forest Preserve was able to float a referendum, which passed by 68%, So, which is unheard of if you know anything about referendums. We are the only Forest Preserve in uh, district in DuPage County that the public actually voted specifically to buy. So we now own 88 acres and the building um, forever. Once land in Illinois is owned by the Forest Preserve, it can never again go back into the property tax producing base. So we can, if we want to trade land or sell it to like-minded places like park districts, but it has to be owned by the public and open to the public in perpetuity. So the public likes to hear that this is also their building. They own part of it too. 
<clears throat> so Mr. Peabody was born in Chicago in 1859. This is a picture of him from Yale. He uh, attended Yale University, and then he came home and worked in his dad's law firm. After about two weeks, his dad sat him down and said, hey, son, you should find another career. Law isn't your career. So uh, with his buddy, Samuel Insull, they each chipped in $50 to start a coal delivery business. Now, this is at a time when the average annual salary was $340 a year. So Peabody and Samuel Insull chipped in 50 bucks each and had a coal delivery business. Within a year, Peabody had figured out that if he owned the whole coal operation, he could make more money. So he bought out uh, Samuel Insull, formed a company called Peabody Coal. It's still around today, it's called Peabody Energy, but the Peabody family is completely out of it now. Samuel Insull did not do too badly for himself. He um, started Commonwealth Edison and uh, had an estate uh, that is now owned by the Lake County Forest Preserve District um, up in Lake County. He married, um, Stuy uh, Francis Stuyvesant Peabody married May Henderson in 1887. They had two children, Stuyvesant, everyone called him Jack, and a daughter, May. They had an interesting marriage because after Mrs. Peabody dropped off May at boarding school when she was in first grade, the two of them were never seen together again. And we believe they, they never were together again ever after that. We know they were a couple of times in the same city. Um, we have records of that, but not that they ever spent any time together. And in fact, we have letters from the children um, when they were in uh, grade school and junior high and high school saying things like, oh, Papa, we're looking forward to seeing you at Christmas on Christmas Eve. But just this once, couldn't you stay over and have Christmas morning with Mama with us so we could be like a proper family? So there's, we don't know what happened there. Um, uh, Francis Stuyvesant Peabody was apparently a charismatic man, um, well loved by everyone who met him. And yet he was a pretty bad record keeper. So we don't have a lot of records from him. He married um, a widow, Mary Stilwell in 1909. And we have some records from the Tribune. There's a statement in the Tribune that says, <clears throat> pardon me, that says um, Mary Stilwell, or the widow Mary Stilwell and uh, coal baron um, Francis Stuyvesant Peabody boarded a train to New York, but they're not going there to get married. And then the next, the very next day, there's a little blurb in the Tribune saying, well, they got married and now they're on a boat to Europe for a four month honeymoon. And then when they came back, all the, any fuss about it was, um, was over. And by all accounts, they had quite a love match. We'll talk about that in a minute. So Peabody coal became quite the thing. Uh, you can see in the bottom picture here that they used large dogs to cart the coal out of the mine and over to wherever it had to go. Um, the, the upper right uh, picture is a coal plant in Illinois, but Peabody, by the time he um, died, he, he owned the coal business. Um, in the United States at a time when coal was the primary heating source. He was such a big deal in the coal business that um, in uh, World War I, Woodrow Wilson asked him to step off the ballot. He was running for Congress so that he could come to Washington, D.C. and manage the energy effort for World War I. So he did that. He lived in Washington, D.C. for a time. <clears throat> So this is what he looked like in Yale, and this is what he looked like toward the end of his life. But you can see he's got, uh, to me anyway, he's got kind of a thoughtful, aware, ready to go look about him um, when you look at his face and his posture. Now, this is an interesting portrait. It's done by a famous artist. Uh, it was donated to us by Peabody's great, great grandson, Stuyvesant Peabody IV who is a lovely man and he lives in Glen Ellen and he's a professional middle-class person. He, don't, um, the, he donated this portrait, it had been in the family forever and the family paid to have it restored for us. We also have another portrait of Peabody's son, Jack, who was um, uh, also uh, by the same artist. This particular artist was noted for 
painting the continents of a person rather than how they looked actually in person. So if you really take a look at this, you see that Peabody was distinguished. He was uh, kind of ready to go, get up and move and um, kind of a beacon of light. I, I think that's how people saw him. If you read condolence letters in the guest book from the place. Now, another interesting thing is the portrait might be haunted. So we are careful to be very nice to it. <clears throat> Peabody um, got involved in farming as part of the gentleman farmer movement. And this is interesting to me because the gentleman farmer movement was something that literally could only have happened in the Midwestern United States between about 1880 and about 1927. What happened was there were a bunch of self-made men, all men, um, who uh, were kind of at the peak of their careers, had a ton of money and a lot of energy and a lot of ideas, and they wanted to get back to nature, back to the land. This was kind of in the Daniel Burnham era, um, where, you know, there was the green belt in the Chicago area, but this could not have happened anywhere else because in Europe, there was no land available for somebody to start a new farm. Um, it had to happen in a country where there was a lot of new money and an, a lot of new opportunity. And it also had to happen at a time when there was an industrial, industrial revolution in the United States, because all of the small family farms that had been here since the 1700s, they had a, a system of they would have a lot of children, raise the farm, live off the land, and then repeat. But what happened starting around 1880 was kids didn't want to stay on the farm anymore. They wanted to move into the city and have a modern life and make more money and, um, you know, have, have some fun in their world instead of just working on the farm. So what happened was there were a lot of farms that were going broke and there was a need for farms because all these people moving into the cities grocery stores weren't there yet. You couldn't just go to Jewel and buy eggs. Somebody had to get the eggs to them. So men like uh, Mr. Peabody started buying up farms. And you'll see on the Time uh, magazine cover um, was Mr. Cutton, who had a dairy farm, very famous dairy farm. Um, and he, um, he had a gentleman farm that now belongs to the Forest Preserve called Hidden Lake. Up on the upper left is uh, St. James Farm that was International Harvester with the McCormicks. And again, Forest Preserve owns it today. And then Sedgley Farm was another uh, gentleman's farm here in the area. These all would have been contemporary of, contemporaries of Peabody, but they all started sooner than Mr. Peabody. He kind of came late to the game. He started buying up farms on the site of Mays Lake um, in 1910. He bought a pig farm, he bought a dairy farm, he bought um, a chicken farm, he had sheep, and he had horses. So in the end, he bought up about 900 acres, and it went from where 31st Street is now, all the way to Ogden Avenue, Midwest Road, and Route 83. So it was a large chunk of land. Today, with our 88 acres left, we still have a unique uh, ecosystem here. We're one of the few places in Illinois that has all five ecosystems on one small chunk of land. We have a, a prairie that is absolutely stunning. And if you wanna come out and see the house, come out in the summer and we'll take you for a walk in the prairie too. So Mr. Peabody was one of the gentleman farmers. And as a result of the gentleman farmers, the Forest Preserve in DuPage County had an opportunity to buy up large chunks of land. So because Mr. Peabody owned 900 acres and then the Friars owned it for 70 years, the land was never piecemeal developed and we were able to buy the big chunk of it. The Forest Preserve bought uh, St. James Farm, the McCormick's place from um, the son of McCormick himself and we were able to get it undeveloped. So we have big chunks of land for the public to enjoy because of the gentleman farmer phenomena. So in that regard, Peabody himself was, was very, very important to shaping the, um, the world of DuPage County, even though he didn't ever really live here full time. <clears throat> now let's take a look inside Maze Lake. If you can look at my picture tiny on the screen there, you can see right off the bat, one of the problems with these big old hundred year old buildings, I'm sitting in the absolute best light possible after dark in the building. So um, it's kind of always gonna be a darkish building, but this is what the building looks like. There is an entryway here. There's a hallway. 
This area right here, if you can see my cursor, is where the living room is. So we're going to start in the entryway, then we're going to move to the sun porch, and I'll kind of talk you through the building. <clears throat> this is the front door opening to Maze Lake. It's the main entrance. And you can see that up here is Peabody's coat of arms. Excuse me, I'll tell you more about him about that in a minute. You can also see that there's some very fancy um, cement work around here. And you can also see that there is a fair amount of disrepair. Excuse me a minute. <coughs> it's the cold season. So the front door is made out of oak. It's very heavy. When Peabody built the building, the doors opened inward. But if you remember from Benjamin Marshall and the um, Iroquois Theater fire, where the doors opened inward and people jammed into them when the theater caught on fire and couldn't get out, anytime now a building is open and accessible to the public, the doors have to open out. So Peabody had at the top where the glass is up here, he had this grill. Um, it was, it didn't go up or down. It was just kind of a nod to English Tudor and that style. Um, we had to take this grill off because the doors wouldn't open outward with the grill there in the way. And we had to, for legal reasons, we had to have them opening out. We are getting ready to close down in May for a full year to do a complete ex restoration of the exterior wrap of the building. And one of the things we're going to do is put this grill back on. We're going to reconfigure the doorway slightly, leave the appearance of it the same, but make it so that we can get the grill back on, even though the doors have to open out. <clears throat> You can see also, excuse me, that there are some unique um, little bits of artwork on the cement in the building. And I'll show you some others on the inside of the building. What's interesting to me is we have no clue what Peabody was thinking. We don't know if these had particular meaning to him or if maybe he handed his wife a catalog and said, honey, pick out some things. We have money in the budget. Or if these were a, a little touch of Benjamin Marshall saying to Mr. Peabody, this would look great. So we know that Peabody requested a Tudor style, Tudor revival style mansion. He was very proud of his English heritage. When we look up, they're all over the building are these cement decorative things. When we try to research them under English Tudor revival, we don't get much. But over this last summer, I was visiting a friend who lives in um, one of Paul Frederick Olson's courtyard buildings. And the courtyard buildings are in Chicago, they're considered Gothic revival. And I walked in the door and there was all of the same kind of cement that Peabody had. So now we've started Googling a little bit of Gothic revival and we're starting to find some more meaning behind some of these little interesting bits of cement that Peabody had put in. This, of course, um, is a Tudor rose. We don't know what this grill is. These look sort of like baby dragons or like wilting flowers, but they're there. Also, <clears throat> Peabody has in the front and one in the back. This is his family motto. He, um, uh, the Peabody's date back to the 13th century in England. And his original name was Paybody, was the family name. And essentially, they were tax collectors for the king. And the king gave them this crest and gave them the, the motto. And the motto in Latin means, or in English, means a good conscience is like a wall of brass. So from the 13th century in England, what this essentially was, the king saying to the Paybody family, we trust you. That, that you will never try to tip over the crown. We think you're solid and good hard workers. Peabody was so proud of that, that he was also kind of the change order king. There were a lot of change orders on the building. One of the change orders was for to have a custom made coat of arms to go on the back of the house as well. And we had the bill of sale for that. It cost $8 a day and took 10 and a quarter days to put in. So we have payment of uh, $82.50 for a replica of this in the back of the house. Now there's also kind of up on the roof a little bit more, 
there's uh, there's a monk on one side and on the other side of the door is a workman, uh, some kind of tradesman. And clearly you can, you can see the detail in the expression in the face. These were not just stock molds. They were clearly fashioned for a reason. We have no idea who they are or, or where they came from or why they're there. They do look kind of dramatic when you start thinking about the entrance to the building. When you walk into the building, <clears throat> what you see is a doorway here. You can see it's got an arched doorway here. We have literally no pictures of the time that Peabody lived here and what the entryway looked like. The Franciscan friars put this door in, so it was not here at all. And this is beautiful stained glass because the Forest Preserve is a secular organization. We took that out and it's stored now in our archives and we just had plain glass. Um, the friars used the room behind this as their chapel. And we do have some pictures of that. But this is what you would walk into without, of course, the religion or the doorway here. These are sconces on either side. We don't know what happened to those. We now have kind of some ugly 1950 sconces that the friars put in. But this up here is one of the original light fixtures. So you can see we have four original light fixtures in the building and I'll show all of them to you. You can see that this one has roosters around it and it's, it's a black wrought iron. Um, it's been electric ever since the building was built. It, the place is wired for electric and it lights up the inner part of the entryway. It doesn't uh, shine up into where the stairwell goes. So we wondered again, what was Peabody thinking when he picked an entryway light fixture, the very first thing you see when you walk in that has roosters on it? So there was a very popular myth at the time of Peabody's life um, that we believe he knew about because of things from the library that we've seen um, that said, if a rooster crows in front of your house in the morning, you will have company by evening. And we know that he built this building for company. We have four guest rooms with ensuite bathrooms. We have a lot of areas for people to congregate and just sit and enjoy nature or enjoy being here for a visit. And we have a guest book where people have made a lot of comments. So some of the things that the guests had to say um, with memories of a most delightful day after a most enjoyable breakfast, with memories of a grand and lovely day with such dear friends. One of um, my favorite entries in the guest book is a rainy weekend at Mays Lake Hall, but thanks to Mr. Peabody and his lovely wife, we uh, even, uh, and with enough wine, even donkeys and elephants can get along together. So he was a guy who tried to bring people together. But we also know that he had an award-winning chicken farm a uh, poultry farm and possibly his, um, he knew before he built this place that he had an award-winning poultry farm. So maybe the roosters uh, over the entryway were a nod to his poultry farm. Shown here in the cap holding one of the roosters is Frank Conway. Frank Conway lived into the 1970s. He eventually owned his own poultry company in Indiana, but until he died, he was the most sought after poultry judge at county and state fairs in the country. He came from England, was an award-winning poultry uh, manager in Canada. Peabody tracked down the best he could find and hired the guy. So he had quite an operation, selling eggs, selling chicks, selling fertilized eggs. And the chickens that he sold were all white. So the reason to have all white chickens is because um, when you pluck them, there is, there's no darkness from the feathers that show. So the Buff Orpington chicken is what you would probably get today if you get a Purdue roaster. <clears throat> we have a hand-carved walnut staircase here that was restored in 2020 and uh, 2021. We hired an antique wood restore guy named Casey Quinn who was here for 13 months with wire brushes, scraping all of the old finish off of this. So again, this is the only picture we have pre-forest preserve of the staircase, someone walking up it on a retreat when it was owned by the Franciscans. This is an original Benjamin Marshall um, staircase drawing here. And you can see very faintly just under the staircase case, it says con stone um, plaster. 
in the little teeny faded writing here. We have all of the original architectural drawings for the building, and we have a lot of these little sketches about what things will look like. So this was the restoration part of the staircase. It took him 13 months to scrape it all down by hand. And what it did was it brought out the detail. <clears throat> this is what it looks like now that it's finished. Um, once it was all stripped down, it's solid walnut. Once it was all stripped down, um, uh, he, we kind of custom made a gloss that went over it. It naturally darkened the walnut, but didn't really change the color. So again, you can see the expanse. This is hand carved walnut from England. And you can tell that it's hand carved because um, this is the entryway. We, we redid the stairs two years ago. They are also solid walnut. This is uh, on, the, on the left of my screen is what the uh, staircase looked like before we started the restoration. And you can see the detail pops and it's much cleaner looking and much brighter. But here's an example of one of the pieces of detail where you, you, if you look on the one on the right that's been finished with the gloss, you can see the marks from the workmen chiseling and hand cutting out things on their own. And you can see how dull it looked before we put the gloss finish on it. It had cracked badly in very many places because the wood had dried out so much. So he, Casey um, invented kind of a process of mixing epoxy with um, sawdust, walnut sawdust, and using it to fill the cracks, sanding them down, waiting for them to shrink, filling it again. So what we have today is a really, really beautiful staircase that's in great condition. <clears throat> Here's one of the posts on the staircase. When we took this post off, it actually fell off because it was in bad repair. We found underneath it, in the 30s, one of the friars had done some repairs and he wrote his name and the date in it. And then we found in the mid 50s, a workman had come in and done some restoration on this post and taped his business card. So when we restored it and put it back together, we had an open house and we asked people to come and write their name and address and a little comment about the staircase. We had over 100 people show up and we put their names and addresses in the in a time capsule underneath this urn so that maybe in a hundred years, Casey was fond of saying that in a, every hundred years, whether it needs it or not, you need to restore the staircase. So we're thinking maybe in a hundred years or 50 years, someone will start restoring it, find that, and maybe find the ancestors of the people who came to this ribbon cutting. So we're trying to promote a little bit of history if we can. So this is our first floor. And we've just kind of done a quick look at the entryway and up the main staircase right here in this area. <clears throat> I'm gonna wander over now to the sun porch. You can see right here where the breezeway is. That area was just a solid wall with windows prior to 1954 when the Friars built a huge addition. And by the way, we don't really know how big this building is and we don't really know how many rooms it has because it depends on what you count as rooms and it depends on how you measure. So if anybody has an idea of how to standardize that, come on out and we'll let you measure for us. So this is the sun porch. It was a room that had windows on three sides and then opened into the library. It was noted because people could just go there and sit. If people, if Peabody had guests who came out for three or four weeks, he wouldn't have been expected to hang out with them every minute of their visit. So they would relax in here. We unfortunately, again, don't have any old pictures of what this looked like. It's been 100% restored. And you can see on the left, um, the doorway that goes into the Franciscan wing. You can also see the beautiful marble tile that's original tile. Um, the first floor and the second floor of this building on the mansion side have a six to eight inch concrete subfloor. So all of our marble, all of our bathroom tile, it's in great shape, never cracked. <clears throat> If we look at the sun porch a little bit, there's some interesting details. On all four corners, there are these grills. Peabody heated the place 100% with coal, naturally. Um, and it was, it was central heating with coal. So when we restored this room, we were able to leave the grates, but we put our own heating and cooling system into it. If you look just above the grate, there is, um, there's four lamps on each side, chandeliers, those are individual crystal 
uh, dipping points that are hung. And, and when you hang the lamp, you have to hang it and then hang the individual crystals. That is not original, but it is a period piece. And we do have some of Benjamin Marshall's drawings and suggestions for what kind of um, lantern should go there. So we replicated it as well as we could. You can also see just above the lantern um, where we had to put in piping for sprinkler systems, because again, we're open to the public. And the people who did that for us did a very, very good job of blending it in. You don't really notice it because they've put it along sight lines and they've painted it the colors that match whatever the wall is. This is the wall. If you look again at the other two pictures up there, um, the wall is called Con Stone, C-A-E-N Stone. It's a limestone that comes from near Con, France, and it's a light creamy yellow color of its own. And what they do is make plaster out of that, cover the wall with it, and then they etch in the lines to make it look like it's tile or brick, but it isn't, it's actually con stone. <clears throat> so now that's the sun porch where we were just over here on the sun porch. Let's duck into the library. Um, an interesting thing that you'll notice as we go along is that the library, uh, the building itself has some really amazing areas and then some areas that are a little bit plain. The library itself, this is what it looked like when the Franciscans were here. They used it as a lecture room. And if you look um, in the um, front part, you, you'll see there's a little archway on either side. The library is a cut through room. It has this amazing ceiling that is also in the living room. Um, the chandeliers, uh, the friars had replaced the chandeliers with um, 1950 like really right out of the Mary Tyler Moore show, pretty ugly copper and brass. We finally found um, a theater, in, uh, a period theater in St. Louis that was shutting down and we bought their chandeliers. So now we have three matching chandeliers from 1919, which was when Peabody started building the building. If you think of those archways on the way in uh, either side to the library, you can see up, up by the ceiling, there's some detail, there's grapes and sheafs of, of uh, wheat and there's oak leaves. Uh, in the middle of both archways is an actual keystone. So uh, again, in theory, if we took that out, the whole thing would collapse. <clears throat> Here's one of the restored chandeliers and you can see the detail in the ceiling. Ceiling again. Now it's interesting, the ceiling is restored and we do have the original gum rubber molds for doing those pieces of ceiling. So if you go back to this, it looks like it's an intricate design, but what it really is, is a whole bunch of pieces. We have this round one and we have a square one and we have a fleur-de-lis one. And they're, they're very heavy and they're kind of flexible. So they would be filled with plaster. Once the plaster was dry, it would be carefully taken out and fill another one and just keep on and then uh, put the ceiling together and plaster over where the seams are. And it's pretty amazing. You really can't see the seams. <clears throat> In the library are some, again, some of those quirky little details that we don't quite know why or where they came from. But um, it, toward the bay windows, there are two columns. And on each column are a whole bunch of carved wood. And again, we believe hand carved, uh, not oak. Uh, the, the library is designed to look like oak, but the only oak in it were the, the front pieces that covered the shelves. So again, we um, these look like English Tudor 13th century kind of guys. This person here has um, uh, a, some kind of laurel leaf around their head. So we have, there's a bunch of these at that end of the library. And again, we don't know what Peabody was thinking when he put them there. So the library today looks like this. And you can see that there's a huge stone fireplace. The fireplace itself was never used. There were four wood-burning fireplaces in the building and Peabody died before he could use them. But some of the detail on the fireplace is really fascinating. There are two cherubs at the top playing flutes, which again, why? It's beautiful, but why? Um, if you look around the outer edge of the pit of the fireplace, there is a dragon eating a snake, and then uh, as it goes around, the snake eats the dragon, then the dragon eats the snake, and it keeps going around. So that's, again, 
really interesting detail. The floor in the library is an oak floor with pine uh, stains to look like mahogany bow ties. Um, the friars were not so big on decorating, which is good for us. They never painted the woodwork or destroyed any of the beauty. But, but one thing they did was they overcleaned. So the floor in the library is probably as good as it's ever going to get. We can't strip it again, and we don't want to ruin it by staining it without cleaning it. So that's kind of the floor that we have. <clears throat> so sun porch through the library. Now, another interesting thing about this building, when if you want to say to yourself, what was Peabody thinking when he did this? There are literally no two rooms on the same floor. So you have to go down three stairs, up two stairs. Um, there's every room has up or down stairs, even if it's only two or three. So if you're in the library, you come from the sun porch in the library, now you're heading into the living, the dining, the living room of the building. Oops, sorry. We are going to first go to two rooms off the library. The one over here on my right that you can get into from the sun porch is called the comfort room. And that's just a very small room. It, it um, has a, a fireplace that would have had coal in it just for comfort. There's a curtain to block it off. We think maybe this is where people who are visiting Peabody would sit to pay their bills or write in their diary or just close, you know, closet themselves in for a little bit of a private moment. But you can also see, even in the comfort room, there's some of this interesting detail on the wood that, again, we don't know where it came from. We don't even know who, who did the carving or where, where it came from, but it's really beautifully done. <clears throat> So that's the comfort room. This room is Peabody's um, study or office. By the time he took, he, it built Mays Lake and moved into it, he had handed over his um, uh, coal business to his kids, his son, and mostly was working on the farm. So this is where he would have done that business. And you can see through this, if you cut through the library, you go down a few steps, cut through the library, and you're across the hall in the comfort room. Now his study has a really interesting feature. Um, this is called quarter sawn oak. So the walls and the doors in the study are quarter sawn oak. Quarter sawn oak, if you're making planks of oak, you're just gonna cut a log and have big long pieces of wood. With quarter sawn oak, you cut, turn it a quarter, cut again, turn it a quarter, cut again. And you keep doing that until the log is used up. It's very expensive. It creates a fair amount of waste, but each of these panels has a seam in it that you can hardly see. When you cut and turn and then cut again, what you get is something that's like a, a book or a picture. These lines in here are medullary lines. They're like the veins in an oak tree where the sap and, and um, debris transfers back and forth in the oak tree. And you can cut the quarter sawn oak in such a way that you can piece it together to make it look like art. It is really stunning. This, uh, the one on the lower left um, looks like a tree of life coming together. And I don't know if it shows up in this but some of the scraps of wood would have been the crossbars in between. And the lower uh, left crossbar matches up with the design, the medullary lines in the upper right crossbar. Um, if you, we have people come here and just spend like five hours looking at the oak, the quarter sawn oak in this room and photographing it. <coughs> you hardly ever see quarter sawn oak anymore because it's expensive. Also in his study was um, one of the small fireplaces that was never used. It would have had a little coal burning, uh, just for comfort, a little bit of extra warmth, a little coal burning grate in it, but you can see how clean it is. It was never used. <coughs> Pardon me, and you can see up above it is more, um, more of the uh, spectacular quarter sawn oak. But you can also see that here's a shield. We, we, got, we have no idea where that shield came from or what its meaning was. There's a little bit of fancy design in here, but this fireplace compared to some of the others is pretty basic and plain. <clears throat> so that takes us out of the study. And now we're gonna go into the living room. <clears throat> 
In the beginning, Peabody wanted people to walk into his entryway and see all the way through to the back of the house where, where there was a lake, Maze Lake. Um, so these dark doors are the ones the friars put in. They wouldn't have been there originally. And then these doors off of the living room on the other side would have taken people out to a terrace. <coughs> Pardon me. This is what the living room looks like in a long way. It's a very long, very narrow room. Um, they probably would have had an area for playing cards or charades or taking the furniture out and had dancing or whatever. You can see again, the very nice ceiling. The sconces and the chandeliers again are period pieces, but we don't really know what Peabody would have put in there himself. Um, just to give you an idea of the kind of workmanship in this room though, if you look at this fireplace, Again, wood burning fireplace never used. If you look at where the arch peaks in the, um, the uh, part where the wood goes in the fireplace, you look up and there's a shield perfectly aligned right above it. That is perfectly aligned with the sconce, which is perfectly aligned with the bow in one of the um, design pieces of the wood. So pretty amazing that um, the workmanship back then, it, it blows my mind because it was done with paper and pencil and not with computers. <clears throat> there is also on the fireplace in the, uh, in the living room, some amazing detail. This is another, on either side of the fireplace, there is a, a lion. And again, we don't know why, but if you look at the facial expression on this lion and the detail with its mane and its tail and its feet, really amazing workmanship. <clears throat> this is what the living room looked like uh, in the Franciscan era. They used it for a chapel until the 50s when they built toward the back of the, um, they put the addition on toward the back of the mansion. Here's something that's interesting. If you look at the marble floor, this is um, tessellated marble flooring and it's in perfect condition. But if you look at it, it's, if you bring in a level, it's perfectly lined up down the steps and into the dining room. It's also perfectly lined up across the library and into the sun porch. So again, workmanship that was done with paper and pencil, it's pretty amazing. <clears throat> but now we get into a room that's kind of plain. The dining room itself, pretty plain. Um, there's no fancy ceiling, no fancy anything in here. The windows, if you look at the windows, there's aluminum along the bottom. The Franciscan friars took the original windows out because it was costing them too much to heat the building. When we do our restoration, we're going to take that aluminum out and restore the windows to their original size, but not their original type because there's a budget constraint there. Uh, this is what the room looked like um, when the friars were here. You can see how it leads into the living room. Now, if you look at this picture uh, in uh, the small one up in the top corner, you'll see a little hint of red in there. This is a, a breakfast nook. Uh, in Peabody's mind, people would get up and wander down and come here and have a leisurely breakfast and go out. We don't know that it was ever used. Right now, we hardly use it because it leaks very badly. If you look at that little red box there in the uh, behind the curtains, um, Benjamin Marshall uh, was apparently concerned about fire after the Iroquois theater fire, and so was Peabody. So they put in three places around the building, one, one in the kitchen, one in Mrs. Peabody's hallway, and one in um, the um, kitchen. kitchen. There's three in the building. There's one in the kitchen, one in the Peabody's area, and one in the servants' quarters. Uh, fire suppression systems that would have gone um, uh, in, uh, taken from tanks on the roof in case the building caught on fire. It never did because he didn't live here long enough. So now if we look and go kind of head upstairs, I'm just gonna give you a quick little peek at Mrs. Peabody's chamber and Mr. Peabody's private suite. So at the top of the stairs, this is what it looks like going into his private suite. Again, that Tudor revival thing of um, the Lord of the Manor is always a few steps above. <clears throat> These are again, original light fixtures. The, the other is that we have in the building. This is Mr. Peabody's private study. When, when he was home alone with just his wife or his wife and the grandkids, they wouldn't have heated up the whole house. He would have just been up here. Um, 
It also has an interesting feature. The shelves that have a flat wall behind had originally flat doors that, that you couldn't see through. The ones that had the nicer background behind the shelves had glass shelves or glass doorways on them. This is Mr. Peabody's bedroom, had a lot of windows. You can see through his windows where the Franciscan edition is. That would not have been here, so he would have had this open area of, to look out on three sides of all of his windows. He had all, all of the bedrooms have ensuite bathrooms, but Mr. Peabody had the only standing shower in the building. <clears throat> and they both, Mr. and Mrs. Peabody both had wicker thrones over their toilets. This is Mrs. Peabody's room. Again, probably the best view in the place. It looks out over Mays Lake and it, it's, uh, it's spectacular in the summer when the trees are, are in bloom. Of course, Peabody didn't have trees there when he moved in. This is Mrs. Peabody's dressing room, which is possibly bigger than my whole house. This is her bathroom. And if you notice the, the poles on the sink, they're made out of a glass aluminum um, kind of process, so they have a, an interesting grayish silvery tint to them. There's a couple of unique features. One of the bathrooms does not have windows. So what Marshall did was put in um, a series of mirrors. Uh, if you look at this, there's a skylight. And if you go about three feet over and up and around a corner, there's a series of mirrors from the roof that create a light tunnel that move over and bring light into that bathroom. He also had in all of his rooms, he had an interesting uh, access to plumbing in every one of the bedrooms. So there was no having to bang out the whole shower to fix a plumbing problem. He had, this was a nod we think to Benjamin, Mar Benjamin Marshall in his hotel building. All of the bedrooms had these um, closets that have shelves for linens. This is what the upstairs hallway looks like, looking toward the servants' wings where you can see the original light fixtures and you can see how long it was. Um, pretty grand when you, when you think about uh, what this must have been like in its heyday. So what we're gonna do now is just take a quick look down the, up, back up into Peabody's um, original study, his sitting room upstairs. Behind this panel in the middle, framed by the picture in the bookshelf is a hidden staircase. And there used to be a switch. You would reach behind the bookshelf and click the switch, but the Franciscan friars broke that. So now we have to bend over and pull it out. The hidden staircase enters <clears throat> uh, down in, in the little office that Peabody had off of the staircase and off of the library. And what's interesting is there, when you come down the staircase, you can see here, there's a little wine cellar. You come down the staircase, little wine cabinet. So he was living here during prohibition or right around prohibition. So one of the theories is he just wanted to be able to duck down when he was in his jammies and get a bottle of wine and come back upstairs. But then that is a false door and it opens and it goes down the basement to absolutely the ultimate man cave. Um, in, into the basement. We don't know why Peabody did that, but we do think that at the time he lived out here, it was very remote. Would have taken the police about an hour and a half to get here. Um, and unions were just beginning to organize. There was a lot of union unrest about the mines and maybe he was scared for his life or just wanted an escape route. But then he built, again, what was he thinking? He built a hidden passageway that has windows in it. So we don't know what that was about, but. Um, <clears throat> and it pops out in the basement, a uh, billiards table that was there, the friars used it until they left the building, and, it, and uh, we uh, had to saw it into pieces to get it out of the building, it was so big. There's a man cave um, with a marble massage table in it, uh, so a lot of fun things in the basement. But if you look on the other, the doorway coming down from his study, if you look on the inside of it, there's an actual combination lock. So if someone broke into the basement, they couldn't really get up without Peabody coming down and opening that for them. So oh, kind of zipped through that, but I think we're sort of on time. Um, if you would like a more in-depth look at Maze Lake Hall, we've got a three um, series program called Delightful Details. We have got a team of three research docents here 
who have spent the last six years, about 25 hours a week, doing a deep dive into every single detail in Maze Lake. And on this coming Friday, they're going to take an in-depth look at two of the rooms. It'll be about a 40 minute presentation. And uh, then after that, it's a deep dive show and tell tour where, where they're gonna take you to the rooms and show you what they were just talking about. They have dug up photos that we had no idea existed. And then they'll take two different rooms in February and in March. So that's uh, at 10 a.m. Uh, you can call me or you can register online or you can just show up and somebody will register you. Um, but these three docents, have, they all retired and then they grabbed onto Peabody as their retirement passion. And I think it's gonna be a wonderful presentation. So that's our presentation for tonight. I'm Shannon Burns. I'm the education program coordinator here. If there's anything that I can do for you related to Maze Lake Peabody Estate or to the Forest Preserve, please don't hesitate to get in touch. And now uh, questions. <clears throat> Should I stop sharing? Yes. Okay. Comments, questions? Let's see, we have one question. Oh, oh good. Well, actually it's not so much a question as it is a, um, uh, a comment. It was says mm -hmm. that what the we call the gate on the cast stonework around the front door mm -hmm. is called a, a portcullis and was common, a common heraldic symbol of the Tudor period, hence its use with the Tudor rose. Mm -hmm. Also one of the official emblems for the UK Parliament. So somebody somebody had a little we, bit. We always appreciate there. that information. Thank you. And then, actually um, there's some and, questions under the chat. Under the chat, right? Yes. Pop those up. Um, who was the famous artist who painted the portrait? Oh, you know what? I knew somebody was going to ask that. I don't know. Um, somebody here knows, and what I will do is find out next week and email it to Jane and Julie so they can get it out to you. Okay. And it said the door frame is cement, or does it? Is it limestone or is it cement? Um, it, the door frame on the front door is cement. The rest of the building is limestone. Um, the, the little details on the, um, on the other windows and some of the other decorative things are, are limestone. The um, uh, Franciscan friars, when they, they built the addition themselves and they used the same limestone from the same quarry that uh, Mr. Peabody used in Indiana to get his original limestone. So at least that matches. <clears throat> Um, another comment, are any of the original subcontractors still in business today? Any of the you know, we have got a research project that people were getting started on right before COVID. And I think we're just about ready to open up and get back to that. We have the original construction list and we have the original payment log. And what we're hoping to do is get our researchers to just start making phone calls and get online because, you know, Peabody Coal is now Peabody Energy. So maybe, you know, the people who made something are now somebody else, but they're still around. Um, it's interesting that when you start digging like that, a short tangent, we have a picture of Peabody with his chauffeur um, standing next to a car and it's labeled as a Ford something something model, whatever. So I called the Ford archives in Detroit and said, do you have any information about serial numbers? Do you have a record of Peabody buying this? Any records? And, and she wrote back and said, no, because that car wasn't made in that year. So by accident, you know, something we took as fact, because that was what was written on the photo. By accident, when you start making phone calls like that, you start getting all kinds of information, which leads to more research. And um, we're hoping that when we get around to that construction log, that's what will happen. Okay, uh, another question. Could you explain the, the cyan stone plaster? Or the oh, the con stone plaster? Con, con, mm -hmm. C-A-E-N, yeah. Yeah, so it's near the town of Con, France, and it, mm -hmm. it's described as light creamy yellow limestone. And it's kind of famous because I believe it's the only place you can get that particular kind of limestone. And what they do is they mush it up and turn it into plaster. Okay. And then they just plaster with it like you do regular plaster. But because of the, the porous quality of that particular kind of limestone, it, it's easy to etch. 
So if you come here and look in the sun porch, they actually etched in the lines and then carefully painted them with white plaster. So they do look like bricks. On the other hand, in the entryway, we actually have bricks. So it's, it's interesting. It's kind of delicate too. You rub your finger on it and bits of it flake off. Okay, so they uh, ship the limestone <clears throat> dust from, from, from Cannes, France? Yeah, I'm not positive if they ship the dust or if they ship it made into plaster, but my guess would be oh. that they shipped it as dust because we didn't have the technology to keep things from drying out the way we do today. Okay. I'm guessing that, but that makes sense. And what is the Franciscan edition currently <laughs> being used for, if anything? Um, you know, it's interesting that they built it themselves. It's not as sturdy as the um, mansion itself. But they, they put on a ginormous chapel. And right now we call it the event hall. We have plays in there and concerts. Um, there are uh, two wings that had the only working bathrooms in the building. So there's a men's wing and a ladies wing with bathrooms. Um, we have art exhibits back in the wings. Um, there's four stories above it. Uh, one of the uh, third story wings has been turned into our archive, the district archive for collections. It's um, museum quality, climate controlled, the whole thing, pretty interesting. And we can take you up there. We have a mastodon tooth and other things. Um, so we use that. We have a lot of storage up there. And um, one of the things that we're gonna be doing when we're shutting down is developing a master plan about ways we can use some of that space. It, it would be prime space because of the lighting on the second and third floors, like for artists to rent a small temporary studio. Um, but there's no bathrooms there and the elevator is broken. So we have to get the elevator working. We have to stop the leaking before we can decide what to do. But if you have ideas, we're happy for them. <clears throat> we do, by the way, use the library. Uh, we have a book club with over 50 members. It meets, uh, we have three different meetings in a month. Uh, we do a drumming circle in the library one night a, a month. Um, we do a lot of things in the library also. Well, great. I uh, don't think we have any more questions. Um, oh, wait, one more thing. Wow. Uh, oh, here's somebody. Rolf, Rolf is uh, giving us a little information on the. the Con Thank limestone. you, Rolf. So Chicago was the center of importing, of importing Con limestone in the U.S. It was very expensive. Twin Chapel of St. James has an altar of Con limestone. Oh, nice. thank you, That's good to know. I'll have to go look at that. It's interesting. We have um, some theory. We don't know how Peabody died, but he did die on the grounds here. Um, he was he traveled a lot after he died. He was dug up and reburied four different times. And, and fortunately, now he's in his final place, we hope. Um, but some of our researchers speculate that he was kind of on the edge of going broke. Uh, by the time he got done building this place, because you can see he did some economies in the fanciness of it in different places, but the parts that were that would have been seen by guests were really pretty spiffy. His upstairs sitting room is um, made out of cheap pine, and then the friars tried to stain it to make it look like oak, and they and it didn't, so they tried to restain it to fix it and make it look better, and that just made it look worse. And then in the 60s, they hired somebody to try to make it look like oak again. Again, and by now it's like hideous. So <clears throat> sounds like it's time for a renovation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much for this opportunity. It was fun, um, always fun to talk about Peabody and his house. And there's so many storylines we didn't even touch on. So call me or email me if there's anything else I can tell you. Thank you, Shannon. Mm -hmm. um, thanks everyone for joining us this evening. Jane, any last words? Yes, thank you. That's it was it was wonderful. It, I thought I knew it, the Peabody Estate, but I learned a lot more tonight. I really appreciate that, um, Shannon. This wonderful mm -hmm. tour. Um, I of course want to thank everyone. I also want to say what a small world it is because Samuel Insull, um, his home, uh, it, the Cunio, was designed mm -hmm. by Benjamin Marshall. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's. They, they just, the rare air all seem to know each other, of course. <laughs> anyway, thanks everyone for coming and for joining us. And um, Scott, thanks always. And we'll be together again on February 17th for uh, our uh, webinar on 
uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and the building of Steinway Hall by Stuart Cohn. So we'll all see you then, we hope. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Good night. Bye.